There we go. So today we're going to be talking about thinking like an attorney and, and kind of what that means. But before we jump into that, let's talk a little, I want to introduce everybody to the panelists and I'm going to start with you, Jason, if you'll tell us a little bit about you and what you do uh, and welcome. Yeah, hey there, Brad. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jason Bliley. I'm a corporate business attorney and I've got a law firm here in Miami Beach, uh, Florida. And we do corporate business intellectual property legal services and we work with uh, scaling technology companies and also a lot of freelance workers, uh, folks in the uh, technology space. So we uh, oftentimes work with a lot of folks that uh, are doing things just like the partners at Wix and so I'm excited to be here and talk about these issues. Well, we're glad to have you and super excited that you're here. And also joining us from the community is Barrett and Marshall. Welcome you two. And I'm going to start with, uh, with, with you, Barrett. Tell us a little bit about you. I'm a Wix uh, designer. I'm a freelance designer. I'm in Virginia Beach. I've been building Wix websites for about five years now um, exclusively. And I get, I get the majority of my business from the, the Wix marketplace. Oh, very cool. Very cool. We're glad to have you. Marshall, hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Marshall Fox, and I'm the lead designer with 120 Design Studio. So we're, we're a two-man team, and we serve authors, speakers, coaches, and consultants. And we build websites exclusively on Wix, just, just like Barrett does. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here. We're really glad to, ha to have both of you here. Both of you have both uh, some really incredible work. Uh, and, and, and today's topic, you know, Jason, we're... As you know, there's a mad dash for a lot of people to sort of move into an online space or, or reinvent themselves. I, you know, it's kind of, as Marshall was telling us earlier, there's a lot of people that are going in down the entrepreneur route now, especially during these times. So maybe it's a good opportunity to have the conversation about uh, the business, how to and, and, and how to do this the right way um, for those who exist. Maybe now's a good time to revisit their practices or for those starting out knowing that and 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 what we you and i identified earlier was the three prime things we kind of want to have and discuss in this conversation um like you said getting prepared for engaging with your potential clients um uh, the second part being creating that governing document that contract and what may go in it and then lastly uh mitigating risk um, and that's a lot, Jason, and I'm certainly not an attorney, but I, I also want to make it clear that we're glad you're here. And, and for everybody watching, you're not providing uh, a specific uh, legal directive. We're just talking general things. Um, and this isn't legal advice, but this is just your expertise. So where do we start, Jason? Where, where's a good place to start here? Yeah, thanks, Brent. Um, so, I, you know, we kind of touched on this, but uh, it's, it's really begins with the approach. Um, and so the, as a freelancer or you know, any, anybody who's going to be doing things on their own, um, before you even get to the contract, uh, when, when you're thinking about engaging with a client or a customer and have, having a commercial relationship, there's a little bit of homework that you have to do uh, prior to that, right? And I think that uh, it's easy, especially whenever you're an expert or somebody who's really good at what you do. Uh, to get ahead of yourself and be really thinking about the details and, and you forget that there's you know just the mechanics of, of making it work um, and so going out and, and doing your homework on what the market is uh, you know what, what are the costs and benefits associated with comparable services you know and being ready for those questions that are going to come from the potential customers so that you have really clear uh, expectations to set when you're having those discussions even before you send a proposal or contract uh, and so you really want to know your pricing, really want to know your payment. You know, these are things that uh, customers are going to ask you and, it, and it's going to facilitate, you know, sort of a, a better process to, to get towards what you're trying to do, which is get paid, you know, for, for the work you're doing. Um, and so I think that the, the starting point often, right, is once you've done that homework to put that into a proposal uh, and then have a clearly defined engagement process so that, when you get a lead or you get an introduction to somebody who needs something that you can be confidently uh, ready to send out, you know, a, a document and have a clear step-by-step -step process, you know, to complete the engagement and get started with the work. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question and I want to take just a step back here and, and, and I'm going to direct this question to Barrett and Marshall. 
Now, with in, in, in our community, I see people asking, you know, price check. And so I know people are sort of curious what others are charging. Have you looked in your market for specifically what you do, kind of what Jason's talking about here? Have you compared? I personally have not. I was getting ready to ask um, Jason, how would you do that research? I mean, I question. tend to just charge what I charge and I don't really you know, look around to see what others are charging too much. Um, but, you know, I am interested to know, like, how would you do that research, especially if you're someone who is serving people in different industries? Because, you know, we just serve one type of client over and over and over. So we've kind of found a, a sweet spot for them. But as far as going to see, let's say we did serve lots of different industries, how will we do that research? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. And, and I think that uh, <laughs> to some of these things for granted because research is a lot of what we do every day. But, uh, you know, if anything, I mean, first of all, pricing is a uh, really deep topic. So I'm not going to sit here and say that we're going to be able to cover, you know, just that in, in, in a couple of minutes. But at the end of the day, you can go back to hourly rates, right? I mean, everybody really understands the concept of, of what your hourly rate is. And so then you can go online and try and figure out sort of, on some of the freelancer websites, you know what what you know the published rates are for people, and try and match up your skill set to, to other folks, and that's one way uh, of, of tackling it. But then, you know, a lot of people do the spray and pray, uh, you know, so as I, I and, and that works, you know, and that'll get you somewhere, and you, you keep you know raising the amount that you're charging until somebody walks, and then you know that you've got some sort of reference point, right? But I think that the you know the be the better approach is a more informed approach. And, and you can find that out a lot of times through, you know, published sites that, that have rates on them, you know, through that offer comp competing services uh, or calling them and getting, you know, some information and, you know, just talk, talking to those companies, even if they're direct competitors, you know, call, calling them up and asking them about their services. A lot of people are forthcoming with this information, you know, and, and it really does come back to uh, the value of time you know, as a service provider. So obviously, if you, you know, it really depends on your business model as well. If you're, if you're giving people access to something uh, or you're turning over custom work, then it might not just be an hourly rate. You know, there might be some different uh, pricing considerations there. Uh, but, but that research, you know, a lot of times starts with your competitors. So, you know, and, and if you think that nobody's offering something that's competitive to you, then you're wrong. And I would just encourage everybody to recognize that and to look at, if, if you don't think it's a direct competition, it doesn't matter. You just need to find something comparable, not, not necessarily um, like directly competitive. Great how questions. Much, how much do you think, or do you think it's possible to have one document that we use over and over again um, for a contract so that, you know, we've got one document that kind of encompasses everything that, you know, that we want to say and that will protect us but that we can change little things out of like the number of pages or that we're building for them or what we're charging, that sort of thing. We're not going to have to invent the wheel each time, are we? We get, you know, we'll, so what I've always thought you create one main document that's your main contract that you use time and time again. Is that correct or am I wrong? Uh, I mean, I would be so much more popular as an attorney if I could say yes, <laughs> but, but the unfortunate answer is that, uh, is that it, it really depends on the circumstances. You know, the, the goal as an entrepreneur or as a freelancer is to create a document that is going to fit your average use case, right? I mean, and so, you know, you got your sweet spot. I'm, I'm knocking out websites for $5,000 a piece. It has, you know, X, Y, and Z components. And, and that's really what our sweet spot is. And that's our target, you know client profile. So in that situation, yeah, you, you know, I would hope that you've got, you know, you invest ahead of time and you've got a, you know, a uh, set of agreements that are going to govern that relationship and, and you can get those out, you know, changing just the variables uh, and not, like you said, reinvent the wheel. The, the issue, and especially something I see with a lot of freelancers, is that you're always trying to replace the bottom third of your uh, client roster with, with, with a new a better set of clients, right? And so that means that you're kind of bidding on things that are a little bit outside of the scope that you just did or that you're just comfortable with. And so a lot of times it's not a rinse and repeat scenario. And so if you land uh, that project that might be worth a lot more money, might involve some custom build outs, it might involve you relying on some subcontracted work for some, you know, custom integrations and stuff like that. 
Well, you know, like if your pricing, your average was five thousand dollars before, and now you're you know bidding something out for a hundred thousand, and it's going to take a year of your time. Your five thousand dollar contract uh, is yeah. probably not suited for all those different things that are going to come up in that relationship, because there's just so much more that happens. There's so many more questions uh, that arise from that that sort of commercial relationship. So, so Jason, uh, before we, I mean, I, I want to make sure that we've we've sort of completed the first step, which is sort of. Uh, preparing for the engagement, but you know, and I know, and, and, and Barrett's question I think is more uh, towards towards what goes in the contract, and and there's a lot. So, are, is there anything else in consideration to sort of preparing to be engaged that you want to touch on before we go into the the brass tacks and the nuts and bolts? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I am. I'm off mute. Uh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, the. the the question we get a lot is sort of the process, especially for folks that are new uh, to doing things on their own. They might have left, uh, you know, a big company and they've got an amazing skill set, but then they realize, like, oh wow, like I guess I need a contract, you know. And so then the question becomes, well, what do I send them? You know, is it a Word document, or whatever? And, and if you've been in big companies, then you don't necessarily have a great frame of reference for how small businesses are engaging with each other, and so. A lot of times, I think this comes back to you know a really practical question, not as much of a legal question, but it's, it's user experience, uh, right? And so then it's really sort of how do we make this as seamless of a process as possible? You know, you don't want to uh, annoy the con uh, client, or you don't want to send a forty-page agreement for something that's really you know not some, you know not a project that anybody really wants to read that. Uh, so it's, you know, you have to identify exactly you know what's going to be expected like what are the norms for what I'm doing and then if you understand that you know and a lot of times I'm just speaking to the audience here if you're, if you're doing design work or you you know providing website development services um, you know a, a very normal process is to send a proposal uh, that's got the material business points and then you can either have uh, a set of terms and conditions incorporated into that proposal and so that if they sign a proposal they've agreed to everything or you can reference uh, a set of terms and conditions or terms of service that exist somewhere else that they, you know, check the box that they've uh, reviewed and agreed to. And so that's typically the way we like to, to set things up for our clients. So uh, Barrett Marshall, are there any questions you want to ask on that specifically about sending contracts to clients, anything along that? Oh, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but of course I want to know like how, like what's the best way to put one of these together? Um, because we mentioned yesterday that a lot of our contracts, they're like, you know, Frankenstein, some from Google, some from this site, some from competitors that kind of um, piece together. I know, I know mine is, I mean, it's worked, <laughs> but I know that I'm not protected the way I could be. So um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, if you're going to get to that, but I want to know like, where do I go? I mean, I know you're, you're, you're a resource, but, um, you know, for other people on, on this call, like where do, where do you recommend that they go? I, I, I that is a huge part in the next step. And I, we want to come back okay. and circle back to that. But before awesome. that, in the prep phase, Barrett, do you want to ask anything specifically here about contracts? Yeah, with clients? Um, also in, in the marketplace, for example, we, we get, um, we get leads for websites, you know, where we're going to build the $5,000 websites. We also get a lot of leads for small tasks. And if you're just doing a small job for somebody who's already built their own website, you're going in and fixing things or putting a store in or doing something on their website. Um, and you're not going to send, you know, you're not sending them out a contract to build their website. A, a lot of the times I'm not sending anything. I'm just, you know, doing the work for them and, and charging them, but I'm not, there's nothing, you know, and what, what do you suggest we do in that instance? Yeah. So some of that's going to come down to the, the way you're being engaged. And I'd have to get more into more information about, you know, whether you're getting that through Wix and whether there's an applicable terms of use, you know, there, there's some things once you're on these platforms that you need to be aware of. And and that goes back to the homework you know, side of this is that before you start accepting jobs or entering into commercial relationships, you should you know, kind of do a, a little bit of diligence about what might be governing that work already, right? And so if, if there is something existing, then you need to be mindful of that. If not, 
and it's it, you know then the question is well is this significant to me like you know is is there is there something here that if i you know if i didn't get this money or if i put all this time in is, and it's going to you know cripple my business or you know put me in a bad spot well at that point in time then you might want to consider some sort of uh you know terms of service or something and, and it really doesn't have to be you know uh anything over the top especially if you know if these are you know you know uh, single digit you know, thousands of dollars or, or even less projects, um, you know, you might just have a personal website that has, you know, a set of terms of service. And then you say, you, you know, when you send them a message, you send them a link to that and you say, Hey, can you go on there and just, uh, have a, have a little check the box, uh, you know, assent to these terms of service. And so that way, you know, there's no contracts being sent back and forth. They don't have PDFs or word documents going anywhere. Uh, but you do have a sort of expectations and that's, you know, I, we're about to get into that, but that's ultimately what this whole process is about is setting expectations with the people you're doing business with. Um, because at this point in time, leading up to the contract is when people are going to be most reasonable. And so if you've set those clear expectations, you can always look back to them. And so, you know, especially in these situations where you're just providing sort of ad hoc hourly stuff, you know, and somebody says, well, I want to pay for that. You know, you didn't do X, Y, and Z. You get to, you know, go back and say, hey, look, I'm not going to, we're obviously not going to court over this, but, you know, these were the terms that you agreed to back then. So, you know, if you're, if you're really going to, you know, do me like that, that's, I guess that's the decision you're going to make. But, you know, we did agree that this was, you know, how, how things were going to go forward. It's a good answer. So, and, 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 okay, that's a, that's a great question, Barrett. Great answer, Jason. Thanks. Um, Jason, where do we move now? Is it is it now to talk about sort of how to pack that contract? I know Marshall's chomping at the bit. Is that is that the next piece here? Yeah, I, I think really, you know, the ne next thing to kind of dive into is really how to think about contracts um, and sort of, you know, the, the what's going to be in them, what why they're important, and you know, sort of, and then talking about later on uh, what you do if you know, something goes wrong. Um, so I, th I think the, the first thing, you know, and this is what we harp on with every single client we have, is that you need to be able to clearly define check the box services. So and what I mean by that is have a scope of work or a description of your services that is not uh, something that can, is, that's subjective in nature or, you know, that's going to be arguable, right? You want something that is concrete and something that you can say once you've done it, you know, you can check the box that it's done, right? You don't want to, you know, have anything that's subject to the client satisfaction or anything like that. And so um, I, I think that's kind of the, the starting point is that, there, that you have the contract, if nothing else really needs to be something that you've uh, written down that, you know, you can say, you know, however long, like two weeks from now, three month month from now, I've done that and, and nobody can argue that. And so that's, it's really, you know, sort of, in, in individualized to your actual services. So I can't tell you, you know, how to say that every single time because it depends on what you're, what you're doing. But well, what's an know, example of that? one? Like what could be an example? So I, I'm, you know, for, for website development, right? So I'm, I'm going to send you a, uh, at, at the end of this, you'll have a, you know, functioning uh, website that has these features that, that uh, function and, and so then you have, you know, you list out the, the, the features and then if there are any limitations in those, like, you know, and, and they can't, it, sometimes it involves a little bit of jargon or a little bit of, you know, developer designer speak, um, you know, to qualify these things, but you want to have some limitation. There. You don't want to have something that says, you know, I want a best in class, um, you know, the website that uh, attracts a, a lot, a lot of attention and has, you know, great responsiveness, right? Like, what, what does that mean? You know, like there's, you know, there's, there's really nothing there. And, and somebody can argue about that, you know, till they're blue in the face. Uh, but if you say, you know, that you're going to deliver, you know, a, a website on the Wix platform that's got these integrations, um, you know, one, two, three, and that, you know, has X, Y, and Z pages of copy, right? And and it has, you know, the, it'll, it'll have, you know, whatever, whatever performance metrics, you know, are available to provide. And then you'll know, once that's done, right? Marshall, does your Frankenstein have that? It has bits and pieces of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I think it could also have the 
you know, we were talking about the, um, the, the expectations of the timing of things, you know, that you can check off, you know, I will deliver the website to you, or we will deliver the website to you, you know, in two weeks, you know, from the date of this agreement and, you know, what, Absolutely. what things are going to happen. Yeah. And, and I was really, that was really just a starting point. That's definitely not where a contract ends, but uh, you're absolutely right. The, the duration and the, uh, I think one thing we were talking about yesterday, the scope leads into really nicely is understanding the completion point. You know, when, when is the work done? Uh, and so then, and, and there's also, you know, I mean, we talked about scope creep and all the different things, but, but basically the, the agreement and the contractual mechanism we use a lot of times uh, whenever it's, it's appropriate, you know, whenever it's an actual project is uh, the, the, the concepts of uh, delivery and acceptance, you know, like what constitutes delivery, when, when will, you know, you deliver, uh, you know, the, the, you know, either the access to the website or the source and object code, whatever that might be, um, or the design, you know, the assets. And so at, at that point in time, then you also need the, the other part, which is what a lot of times, you know, is, is left out of contracts is what constitutes acceptance. You know, is it email confirmation, right? Is it, is it somebody saying, okay, yeah, I got it. Is it can, can it be verbal confirmation? Uh, do you even, do they even need to accept it? Or is it just your sending that uh, constitute, you know, three days without complaint constitutes acceptance and you sort of have a negative relationship. There. So there's a number of ways to do it, but you want to define uh, a cutoff point so that, you know, you can make sure, you know, there's no open-ended statement that, well, I never got this, right. It's a, or, or you never delivered that, right. It's like, well, it says right here, you know, what the process is for, for us to have that. And, and, Charles has a, has a fantastic comment and question to this, right? So um, sometimes he'll send a contract to a client and it takes the, where he says it'll take two weeks to get their project completed. And then it takes them three weeks to come back. And then they're like, then they sign it three weeks later, but he's in a much, much busier space and can't actually meet his own contractual obligations. How do you address that? That's a really good question. Do you have any Marshall, Barrett, have either of you experienced that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. I have. <laughs> they tend to yeah. roll. <laughs> what do you do? That was deep. That was deep. There's something there. Um, so yeah, great, great point, Charles. And thanks for bringing that up. The uh, tool that we like to use for that is to set a uh, proposal uh, timeline. So basically the effectiveness of that proposal uh, is only going to be available for a certain amount of, of days, right? And so that way, uh, when they come back to you, or if they come back to you, then you have the ability to say, well, hey, these are our, our effective rates now, because this is, you know, whenever you're a service provider, it's subject to your availability. And if your sales cycle, right, I mean, if you're going after ginormous, uh, you know, technical, uh, contracts, right, then uh, you might have a longer sales cycle and you might be willing to wait months, you know, to hear back from somebody if you're going to get a project that's going to last years and you know that's, uh, you know, what you're going after. But most of the time, you know, the average the average freelancer or design person is not, you know, in, in that position and they need things to move. And and you you might be willing to shift things around or get less sleep if the rate is higher, right? And, and so you don't want to be bound by those, uh, you know, terms that you, you put forward when you didn't have anything to do in your slow months, right? So you set that expiration and, and that's the contact, you know, like the, the, the key to changing yourself from a static contract to a, a proposal that uh, incorporates terms of service allows you to have a, you know, from a customer's perspective, uh, more of a dynamic pricing model because it's, hey, this is, this is our proposal now, right? Not our proposal that's effective until, you know, we're done and out of business. And it also puts a little pressure on them. You have five days to sign or right. we have to start the process over. Right, right. And so some people might, uh, you know, push back on that or have issues with it, but you, that that's it goes back to having an overall communication scheme, having nicely branded documents, having a, you know a process for sending this stuff out. So, because if you give the impression the, the impression to the people you're doing business with that you know this is a professional process and it's going to go just like we want it to go, because that's how it goes with everybody. And so you can you know if you're going to come into our ecosystem, you're going to have to go along with that. Uh, versus if you just you know flip somebody a word doc you know, that doesn't have any, you know, customized information in it. And it looks like you got it from the internet. Uh, people are going to take that as a cue that they can, you know, change it as they see fit because you haven't thought about any of this stuff. Those are great points. 
Can you use a proposal in place of a contract? Or do you so, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, so uh, a contract, it, you know, is really sort of a, a legal concept that's, you know, uh, the result of meeting certain elements. So, you know, and, and so a proposal can be uh, a contract if, if, if it meets those elements, right? And so you need to have, but, but, but I, I, you know, without going into like the, the real deep legal stuff, right? If you have a scent, you know, by the parties, like a meeting of the minds, essentially, you know, th then you're, you're you're typically in a position to to rely on that as as a as a you know legal agreement, right? And so, being a propo a proposal, uh, you know, if you if you write these correctly, is is basically like, like I said before, can set out the business terms of the of the agreement, and then you can have sort of the rest of the uh, you know information and provisions that are going to govern the relationship. In the terms of service, and so, but they're each a, a part of what, what you're referring to as the contract. So, if they sign the proposal, you know, there's going to be language in that proposal that says they're also, you know, by signing this, they're also they're agreeing to the proposed terms in, in the proposal, but they're also agreeing to your terms of service, right? Now, where can the terms of service live? Can that live on your website? Yeah, they can. Live, you can be very creative with about this stuff. Um, it can be incorporated into the PDF that you send out. It can be online and, the, and, and then, but if, if you're doing that, you just wanna make sure that you have uh, a clear a agreement to it. So whether it's, you know, a signature on a proposal that tells you where those, those terms live and then there's some representation by the signer that they've reviewed those terms um, or you have some platform uh, that you use and, and there's a lot of software out there that can automate these things. We, we have a, a contract management system for our clients that uh, will allow them to do this stuff sort of, you know, digitally and send out, you know, links and then people can have some analytics and they can see when people are opening them and then they can, you know, have, have the contract and, and links to the terms of service or have them built right into the, the contract that gets sent out. And so there's a, you know, you can get creative uh, with how you do this stuff. So just like, I mean, we're very used to this stuff, you know, and, and if you think about it in your own life, Right? When you get on the app store, you know, when things are scanned, you know, you're getting your face scanned for consent to, to buy an Uber Eats, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, these are all versions that have be become, you know, that have evolved with technology to show assent to an agreement, right? To, to show that you agree uh, to the terms that are go governing that relationship, that commercial relationship. What if now, your proposal is an email and it's, you know, very set out very um, detailed and you request the client to respond to the email and in no certain terms accept what's in the email is that legal uh, it can be so whether that's as clean as you would like it to be uh is probably right. a good question because is it that email is it the thread above it is it you know the things that come after it right like these are things that you usually address in in the terms of an agreement but if you're just referencing a scope of services uh and you know, oftentimes you know that that's that's acceptable right it can be incorporated by reference if you if you have the right terms uh in your in the agreement that you otherwise you know are relying on um it, it just really it's, it's dependent on the circumstance and so but but you know a lot a lot of folks are putting you know the scope of services in an email and saying hey you know the the terms that you're agreeing to uh are, are what's governing our relationship and the scope of work is what I said in my email on this date to you, right? And so, in that instance, if if, if there was an agreement to, um, you know, a set of uh, the, the terms of service, you know, that were that were in place, that referenced that email, then you're then you're in a good spot, right? But if you're just relying on an, e on an email thread, you know, it, it might it might be a, a questionable, you might you know, it might be a little bit more gray area than you want than you might be comfortable with. And that's a great question. That's a great answer. So uh, here, here's a question. Uh, we're talking, for, for those of you who are joining us, we're talking about, you know, stuff to put in your contract. Um, of course, there's a, there's a legal term for that. Jason, what's it called? <laughs> what, what was the word you used, the, the phrase? Oh, the material terms? Material terms. We're talking about material <laughs> terms. I sound educated. It's so scary. <laughs> so I've, I've got a question to actually to Barrett and Marshall. How, over the years, what are some clauses that you've added to your agreements and maybe some lessons that you've learned? 
Well, for me, a couple that have come to mind, one is like timely delivery of assets. So we may begin a website project, but you know, the client won't provide me what I need for the website for a week or two or even longer. So we put that in the contract that we expect them to deliver the assets to us, um, you know, within 72 hours of us initiating. And we'll talk about all this before they even sign the contract just so they're, that they're aware, but that's something that helps us get things going um, so the project isn't dragging on forever. And on the flip side, once we deliver the website and we also do branding and things of that nature, but once we deliver the, the drafts for their review, they have to review them and provide feedback within a certain amount of time as well. So those are two that come to mind that I've added to our contract. Um, and of course, I'll probably be re reworking after this call, but um, yeah, that, that kind of helps things move along because I've been in situations where an engagement has lasted like months and months longer than it, it should have because I wasn't, you know, I didn't have stuff clearly defined. Yeah, what about I, I would definitely on. say that's a major one what what Marshall was just saying um, the other the other one that I didn't have originally was you know what is refundable if things um, if things do go wrong um, you know are you giving all their money back are you you know what's going on with that and how far along in the um, design process is are things still refundable or not or what, you know, and I think it's very helpful to have that spelled out in an agreement. Yeah, and I mean, it's highly customizable, right? I mean, so the, I think what, what we often see, you know, the, the pitfalls uh, related to money's back uh, is whether or not uh, you, you're starting to use terms of art uh, sort of in a, in a loose way, you know, so if you call something a deposit, uh, but it's really not, it's an advance or something like that, then you, you just need to be careful about these things. And then, and then there's consistency issues, right? If you're calling something a deposit here, a retainer here, an advance here, right? You know, then, then attorneys on the, you know, after the fact, if there's an actual dispute, are going to start poking at that and it's going to create issues. And so you just want to be super clear about it and then, you know, avoid using those legal terms that you might not be, you know, super clear about what they are. You know, if somebody's providing, uh, a, a deposit to secure your time, but it's not refundable. It, you know, it's just going to go towards the, the payment of the project. I mean, then you just need to set that out in plain language. You know, the, 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 you're paying money uh, upfront to secure my time, and that'll be credited towards your final invoice. You know, at the at the end of the you know, once we get to the end of the project. Um, but if it is refundable, you know, then then that's also something that you should spell out clearly. You should you know, the, the, it's just very easy, I think, to rely on terms that pop into your head when you're writing the sentences. But then those terms, you know, just they, a lot of times they have legal meaning. So you just want to be careful and consistent about, you know, how you're defining those things. Man, that's really good advice. That's really good advice. What are, what are other things? So we've talked a little bit about, about uh, managing scope creep. And by the way, for those who may not know that term, what is scope creep? What does that even mean? Yeah, I don't know. Does the designers want to speak to this? Uh, they probably might have a more personal I think everyone, uh, relationship everyone with it. Yeah. Oh, so had at least has dealt with it. So scope creep is kind of what I was talking about. What I try to avoid, where you'll start the project with a, a set of deliverables, and then the client will start to add on other deliverables. Um, sometimes they kind of sneak them in there, and they may be small, but you know they start to add up. Um, so I'm dealing, I'm dealing with one right now. Well, I'm not really dealing with it, but I had a request for something that wasn't outlined and I haven't responded to it yet, but um, it wasn't, wasn't defined. Um, it wasn't in the initial, initial agreement. So, um, but once you know what it is, it's easy to kind, it's easier to, to kind of get ahead of it, let them know, okay, so this is, you know, we won't necessarily say that it's scope creep, but say, oh, well, we, this wasn't a part of the initial agreement. So let's, let's talk about what this would look like as far as um, additional fees and how it would move the timeline of your, your entire project. So. Yep. Yeah. That's the, that's, I like that approach, Marshall. Like, and, let's talk about this. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's hitting on the two really important concepts, which are, you know, the consideration or the, you know, what you're getting paid in exchange for what you've agreed to do previously. Uh, and also, you know, how it affects the, the timing overall uh, and your performance obligations, right, which tend to be, you know, really important as you get to bigger and bigger projects with higher and higher amounts of money involved. 
And so uh, I, th I think really key, you know, beyond, you know, once you define sort of what you're providing as far as services, what, what's going to be delivered, if you're doing a good job having concrete uh, definitions associated with those things, uh, then you're able to say uh, in, in the agreement that, you know, and, and obviously this is different for every business model, but uh, out of scope work or, uh, you know, you know, additional work is a, a lot of times the way you'll define this is going to be done at an hourly rate and you, and you can set a pretty high hourly rate, right? Because you're just using this as an incentive. And a lot of times people are not going to push back on it originally, um, you know, because they are thinking to themselves, well, this, you know, I'm not too worried about stuff that's out of scope because this is what I want done. I'm not worried, you know, I'm not trying to have an ongoing relationship here. And so if it's a really a problem, you just kind of keep, you know, ratcheting up that uh, out of scope, you know, price. And that way you have, sort of an agreement on that or or you have you know sort of a, an entire notice process right and then you have because of the other the other issue that you have a scope creep is sort of this the ambiguity that comes with hey but wouldn't it be nice if this actually did this uh or you know th this had this feature right like the, you know you get, like i thought this might have been included so maybe if it's not like it should be right like and that's your fault but uh you know so i i, I know you're gonna fix that for free right and it's like well no that would require like a totally different back end or whatever you know so um you know it's an it's issue that every service provider faces um but if you if you're really concerned and it really could eat up you know time and money and it's, it's important enough you can actually have change orders right where you have okay, you know, if, if this deviates, you know, and I, I think as a service provider, it's a material deviation, well, then I've got the right to say, hey, we're not doing any more work until we agree on a change order, right? And it's, you know, it's a simple, it's, it's basically like what the scope of work, you know, or scope of services is going to be, and but it's replicated in, you know, in a, you know, sort of a, you know, addendum to the contract that just says, you know, change order, bingo, bingo, it's got the information and what you've agreed to and, and whether that's going to be, part of the project pricing or whether you're going to do it on time and material or, you know, some other, you know, uh, form of uh, payment. So it's do you need an, Oh, there we go. We need... got go for it. Sorry. <laughs> Barry, go ahead. No, no. I'm going in Marshall. I love this. The scope creep that I find difficult is, you know, it's easy when it's like, yes, we want to add a page or we want to add more um, products to our store or something like that. But the scope creep I find difficult is design scope creep. I have a, a client right now who, who, who they don't know what they want design wise. And, um, you know, they keep showing me other websites. Well, I like what these people are doing over here on this website. Well, I like this one over here. Well, maybe this font, let's, let's play around with, you know, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> and it's, and it's just, you know, it's, it's taking, it's just the hours just add up and, but it's sort of, it's so, you know, hard to quantify um, from yeah. the beginning, you know, how long am I going to work on this one page for you to get the font the way you want it, you know? Yep, and, and design work is notoriously difficult for that. And I think that's, you know, where you can start, if we go back to the concepts of delivery and acceptance, um, if you start building in those things, you know, we're going to give you two iterations, you know, we're going to go through an initial, you know, version of this, then you're going to give us, you know, feedback that's, you know, and that's going to come within two weeks uh, or less. And then we're going to give you a, a second version of this that, that incorporates your feedback. And then you get one final round of comments and then we're going to give you a final uh, version of this, right? And that's the delivery and acceptance process. And so you don't, you know, for more, robust agreements you might have really elaborate you know provisions on this but if, if that's like a specific problem you're facing then then you just build out in, in common language in, in really short sentences what it is that you're willing to do and on on average because of chances are you've done this enough where you know in my ideal customer relationship it goes like this boop, 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 right and so that's what i'm going to write into the agreement and then if you want additional ones you know or if you need additional work then we're going to do that on an hourly basis, or we're going to do that on a, you know, per iteration fee. And, it, and if it's, you know, if it's a situation where uh, they come back and they say, well, we're not happy with what you've done. Like you didn't provide us with what we asked for. Right. Well then, especially in design uh, relationships, right. Then like you start having to think about whether you've priced your services right from the beginning, right. For that specific, you know, if, 
if they thought that they were getting some bespoke, you know, uh, deal that you're going to have some, you know, relationship for the next three years while you talk about concepts and, uh, you know, philosophy while you develop what this image is going to express itself onto the screen. Well, like that's not the same relationship as somebody going on Fiverr and saying, hey, I need, you know, anyone to give me uh, a design that involves a, a face on a coffee mug, right? It's like, those are, those are different things. And so you can't, uh, you know, the, the pricing is going to set those customer expectations, right? And so I think uh, a lot of it has to do with pricing strategy and also what you're defining is the acceptance process. Great question. Mar I, I do have some also from, from um, the, the audience, but uh, Marshall, I know you had one you wanted to ask. Jump in. No, it was actually one, one that somebody brought up um, that I wanted to make sure got asked. So it was really about um, the addendum. So is it okay to have like email confirmation or approval for um, like scope changes or do you need like an addendum? Yeah, no, you can, you can do uh, changes by email, you know, if you're, but if you're going to do that, you probably want to set out uh, a couple requirements, right, so that it's just clear. So, you know, you don't want to have, you know, things being, you know, a lot of times you'll just want it to be your email so that it's your, the information that you choose to have in it and, and they have to, you know, confirm, you know, say, you know, some, some sort of confirmation via email and that's going to be fine. And you can define that in the agreement as an acceptable way, you know, to issue a change order. What you don't want to do is have just, you know, the scope can change by email and then they send you, you know, something that totally derails your whole plan for having clear objective, obje you know, uh, objectable measures, you know, and, and then you get their lofty uh, subjective uh, description of what they want. And that somehow is incorporated by reference. Marshall's laughing. I think he's experienced that. And by the way, that was Lisa's question. So oh, no. thanks, Lisa. You know, you, you know, and here's another great question. Uh, Daniel's tossing one out there. Um, let's say, for example, you do as you've as you as you've suggested for contracts, Jason, to have a timeline and an expiration. What happens if they do go beyond the timeline expiration, like Marshall was talking about? One of the things that he learned and and to add to his contract is is content you know when you when you need something from from the client or or, or it, there's a limited amount of time for them to give it to you what happens yeah. if they don't is there a penalty clause or do you just need to specify that the timeline will be could be i mean how, what do you say yeah i think so you you can define these things right a lot of people don't like to have really restrictive or, or uh you know penalties in, in contracts in fact in fact you know penalties as far as like the legal side goes there's a whole, you know, legal issue with having penalties in, in contracts, but you can, you can have uh, ways to create, you know, additional compensation or whatever the case might be for, you know, the, the increased time to the project. But what, you know, I, I think is, it goes really even further back because a lot of times when people are going to screw you on something like this, it's not going to be worth fighting over, right? And so you're, the contractual language that you put in there, you might have something super draconian, but what are you going to do with that? You know, like, the, are you really going to go and, and hire an attorney and uh, go to litigation or arbitration over, over this type of stuff? Probably As not, we say you know? in the South, it's like squeezing blood out of a turnip. <laughs> exactly. So, so with that, with that being uh, the case and the fact that, you know, majority of payments are being taken by credit card, right? So get a credit card authorization form up front, you know, have it be part of it baked into your process to get a credit card authorization, to have that be on file. We're not going to charge it unless, you know, X, Y, and Z things happen, right? And one of those things is that you have not, you know, paid for something or you violated some, you know, term or you know, run afoul of something that's going to result in additional fees. You've got that credit card authorization and, and you're going to run the card. Now, of course, you're going to come back to, well, you know, they can dispute that, you know, this, I know. They can, absolutely. But again, we have to go back to what is the world of controllable issues uh, for contracts because all of these are, are you know, written agreements. You know, it's not like anybody's bound in chains once they sign an agreement. You know, people can commit fraud. People can do all sorts of terrible things. People can just not follow the agreement. So all we're trying to do is provide you know, different ways to set these things up you know, to put yourself in the best possible position. I, I feel that I have to be so careful with things like penalties and, you know, it gets to the point where even if somebody goes against what is in my contract, I am loath to do anything to them about it because of reviews. 
and whether, you know, no matter what happens in a contract, somebody can hurt me by going and giving me a bad Google review, you know? Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make things as fair as possible and keep the relationship as good as possible. But the bottom line is if somebody pushes at me, I'm more inclined to try to make everything better than, you know, charge them or, um, you know, anger them. So and, and, and these are bit, you're absolutely right. And these are business decisions. And so there, there's no one saying that you have to put these, you know, these sorts of, you know, stick and carrot type, uh, you know, provisions that are going to have things associated with them. Like, you know, the, the incentive being, you, you don't, don't do it. So you don't have to pay more. Right. I mean, a lot of times that's going to be a tough way to, to enforce, uh, the, these agreements. So the, the better way to do it is to think about, uh, strategies ahead of time. And I think, you, you know, trying to get, payment uh, front loaded, right? So that you have, um, you know, okay, well, we need, you know, instead of having just, oh, we just work on an hourly rate, right? Create your services or you know, structure your services in a way where, okay, well, we have, we have an implementation fee or we have a setup fee and then we have, you know, the, you know, fee structure going forward for, for the remainder of the agreement. Some, some way uh, that you're able to get, a, a, you know, more of the money up front in the, in the, in the consumer or the relationship with the customer so that there's less for them to withhold later uh, is, is what you're wanting to do from the vendor perspective. And so obviously, you know, taking everything up front is not likely something anybody's going to agree to because they want you to perform. Um, you know, but if you just think about that in, in, the, in structuring your, your, your payment and pro, excuse me, pricing and payment model, um, then hopefully that you know, gives you some thoughts about what, what you can do uh, to not be so exposed on the, on the back end of the agreement, because that's typically where all these things arise, right? Is whenever everybody, you know, is getting towards the end of the project and they're a little bit sick of each other. And the reality is that, you know, there's really it's in the business, whenever you're, you know, having re relying on a lot of customers, um, you're going to get some bad apples. You're going to have some bad experiences and you just, you know, that goes back to, that goes back to the, you know, something we talked about yesterday was termination and making sure that you have clear termination rights in your contract. Because a lot of people will leave this out. Why would I ever want to terminate my agreement? You know, this is what I'm getting paid. Well, you want to terminate because somebody's a nightmare, you know, <laughs> and if they're just not, if they're, you know, like they're going over, they're demanding things that are unreasonable. You know, a lot of times it's not worth it. You know, a lot of times you, your time is better spent uh, going and finding a replacement client or customer rather than trying to, you know, make somebody happy that will literally never be happy. <laughs> never, no matter what you do, what you deliver, uh, they're going to be upset by that. And so uh, having a, a, a strong provision in there that says you can end that relationship and you're entitled to the fees up until that date and then everybody goes their own way. Um, you know, I think that's usually something you're, you're going to want to be, you're going to want to include as far as a freelancer goes. And, and perhaps... There, you know, a, 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 an example of a termination clause could be if the client fails to respond, uh, and maybe that's one of the things. Like we, I, I don't know, uh, but 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 for me, um, that may sound logical. I don't know. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, you, you 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 can have that under a default provision. A lot of times, what you're going to say is you're going to define you know when the client or customer is going to be in default, and then upon, you know, in default, right? Like then, then you can have a remedy and cure period if people don't want to agree to that. You know, just there, there's so many contractual tools that, that are at your disposal for, for all these scenarios. And, and so the question is, you know, becomes like how practical or, you know, is it related to your business model? But there's absolutely, you know, ways to define what default is and then have termination be one of your remedies uh, as opposed to some, you know, fee or, or any, anything else. Yeah. I one of the attendees, Daniel, says he has an abandonment clause in his contract. So interesting. Some people do use that. Sure. Yep. Marshall, any how often people disappear for months on end. <laughs> yeah, they start they start a website, they give you all this money and then they just go away for like two months. <laughs> and it's, and yep. But it happens yep. all the time. Yep. And and you can in you know the whether you want to be really strong on that or, or not, you know, it's, it's totally uh, up to your business and, and really, I think it depends on the type of customer or client you're servicing and, and sort of the amount that's in uh, consideration. And so, um, you know, but you do want to make sure that you're able to be charging the rates that are current. You know, if you started off your career, you know, closer to 
a hundred dollars an hour. Now you're doing five hundred dollar an hour work. You don't want to be stuck, you know, at those old rates. So you, you want to think about that whenever you have a, a, a quick sales cycle. And, and I like the idea when you talk about the expiration. I think it's really important to sort of hone in on that because, like you're exactly like you said, we all get busy. And Barrett, sometimes our clients get busy too, right? And they've got to go focus on other things, and that's totally okay. But what's not okay is for you to come back two months later and say, okay. Uh, I need this in two weeks because my life may have shifted too. So managing those expectations and putting in that clause, you know, like you're talking about, Jason, yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's super valuable information. And it also, like we were talking about earlier, protects us from scope creep as well. It's the same, it's, it's sort of the same metric there. Right. And, and, the, and those are typically good play, good times to have those credit card authorization forms uh, so that if a certain amount of time elapses that you can, you know, charge what you would have, that, you know, charge the amount of the agreement. And then that's, that's a great way to get somebody's attention is to run their credit card. So, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, lawfully, lawfully, right? lawfully, <laughs> lawfully. Uh, so, so we've sort of talked a little bit about being prepared to engage with clients. Now we've talked about uh, stuff that goes into the contract. Uh, uh, Jason, what's that term again? No, the material terms, yeah. Material terms, we've talked about that. Let's talk a little bit, let's say we have a, uh, we understand, we have our contract in place, we have an agreement, we're moving forward. Let's move into how do we mitigate risk? How much, what, what are some things that can happen? How do we mitigate it? What is that? What, what is the term? Uh, risk mitigation even mean? Yeah, uh, before I get into that, I was waiting for this comment and it's finally here. Um, Marshall, uh, your unbelievable background has been acknowledged. Uh, yes, <laughs> Lisa <laughs> loves your loves your backdrop. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Uh, all right, so uh, risk mitigation, it, it, it's involves so many different things, right? If we're talking about contractually, there's there's a number of provisions that are, are you know dealing with risk mitigation. But just to kind of circle back on something we touched on earlier, this is risk mitigation is really an approach, and it, and it goes back to every aspect of uh, you know the commercial relationship. So planning for it, how the the mechanics work, you know how how the engagement process goes, making sure that you have all of your documents executed and, and signed copies delivered to, to everyone, having a clean uh, and, and orderly, you know, file management system so that you can go find these things. The amount of times I have to like wait for clients to scroll through, you know, thousands of emails to find the contract is, is wild to me. But so, that, you know, all, all these things go into risk uh, mitigation because they're part of, you know, good business practices, which will, uh, you know, help you avoid actual disputes. But within the contract itself, right, there's a, there's a couple really key provisions that are commonly included in terms of service uh, and, and that you really, you know, should, should key into it. And one being a limitation of liability, which in most jurisdictions are, you know, that's, a, that's an enforceable provision to put in. And you can actually specify that, you know, you're not going to be liable for uh, consequential damages or damages that are not related to your actions and that all of your liability is limited to what's been paid under the agreement, right? And so some places you can even limit that further down to set dollar amounts, but generally speaking. Uh, now, what does that mean? Let's, so let's, let's break they, that uh, down. Break that down. So basically what you're telling uh, your counterpart in, in that commercial relationship is that, hey, because of the nature of this work, right? Because this is, this is not stuff that should be impacting your overall like well-being, you know, you might disagree. About it. But, but basically, the way this is set up is that uh, the only thing that can you know, happen if, if you disagree or we have a dispute is that you can get your money back. That's the, extent, that's the extent of my liability. And that's what a limitation of liability provision is saying. Uh, it, it, I mean, can say. So what's an example of that protecting? So you say we need that. What's an example of something if I didn't have that? Why do I need that? So what, what's an that, example? Yeah, let's say that uh, you're, you're building a site for somebody and you subcontract out the work uh, and somebody you know, puts some feature or function in the agreement and, uh, or excuse me, in, in the site uh, to accept payments and the API that they use isn't working and uh, this customer has a high volume business. And so then 
day after day after day, they don't notice and they just then they come back and realize that they just lost fifty thousand dollars in sales because the API wasn't working. Now they have, you know, because they have low dollar sales, low dollar amount sales, they have, you know, three thousand customers they have to go and track down and it creates you know, an absolute nightmare for them. Well, if if you don't have these limitations of liability, right, you might have just opened yourself up to the uh, damages that you know some enterprising attorney can say stem from or arise from your screw up, right? Now we got to pay for this. We got to pay for this. We got to pay for this. So, but if you limit your liability, and you're just saying no, no, no. You the the maximum that you can get back is what you've paid me. Uh, that's what that scenario would look like. So theoretically, it could be a very big deal. So, and, and that's that, you know, that's not what you're limited to as far as risk mitigation goes. There's also uh, reps and warranties. You know, the, if there are certain things that you're concerned about, you're able to include statements that are representations and promises uh, by the person you're agreeing, you're know, entering into the agreement to that, that actually, you know, set forth certain things like that they have. They are, Percent. they represent the company. Um, and so, you know, th those are those are important, right? And then, um, indemnification is another concept that is often left out of contracts because it's a big annoying word, and the provisions are always long and annoyingly complicated. But they're really important, and that's why they're long and complicated. Well, a question is: is is uh, liability limit clauses the same? And it's a great question yeah, that Daniel has. Is it the same as an indemnification clause? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's not. It's not the same thing. Um, they, they are related, um, but, but they're not the same thing. So indemnification, oftentimes, like your standard indemnification clause, especially in design or, or web development services, it, it is going to, you know, the, trying to think of a simple way here to explain this. Basically, you're, you do not want to be liable for stuff that is not your fault. And you're telling the person on the other side of the agreement that if I get sued, because of something that's your fault specifically, then you need to not only defend that uh, lawsuit, but you also need to indemnify or, or take care of any liability that's assessed against me. So for an example, I'm a you know, design services professional and, and I'm, I'm putting together the copy and some uh, you know, content on your website. And I say, hey, I need images for you know, X, Y, and Z pages. Uh, and, and you send over those images but they all are copyrighted by, you know, some large company. And I take those and, and boom, put them into the website. And I got some big gaudy stamp on the bottom of the website that says, powered by Bliley Design. And I think that that's a great decision <laughs> to have that on there. Uh, and then somebody sees that and they say, great, uh, we are suing Bliley Design for uh, using our intellectual property, right? Well, then I get to say, well, no, 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 in my, it, you know, in our contract, customer, you agreed to indemnify, defend and indemnify me if this were to happen because you sent those images to me on, and I believe that those were yours, right? So the question about the indemnification law, though, if you have, if let's say you don't have one, are you limited by your liability for the limited liability clause? Or can the not having an indemnification clause, can they come at you for a different thing because it's not specifically about the functionality of the website? So in the limitation of liability, you're limiting your liability between you and the customer, right? Indemnification is related to things by third parties uh, most of the time, right? And so in that instance, that limitation of liability would have nothing to do with the with third party suit, you know, because they're not bound by the terms of that contract, your customer or client is. I, I'm just curious, Marshall, Barrett, do either of you have an indemnification clause or a limited liability clause? Nope. Oh. So I have to go, I have to go look. <laughs> so I, 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 I imagine that there's going to be a lot of contract reworks after this. Um, yes, absolutely. And I, I want to rapid fire questions at you, Jason. And yeah. I know I know our panelists certainly probably want to to rapid fire questions. So Marshall, I'm gonna turn this one to you. Is there any let's let's and and, and also to the attendees. We're, 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 I'm going to do a little overdrive here, Jason, if you'll stay with me a little bit. Let's yep. do a little overdrive and rapid fire some questions. Marshall? Yeah, so I just had the same same question as earlier. Like, how do we do this? This is a, it's overwhelming. I thought my, my contract was pretty pretty solid <laughs> until, until this call. 
so my question is, you know, how do we do this? Like, what are some resources that we could use? Um, you know, I know that you're a resource as well, but like, you know, for your average Joe, like, what, how do we get our, our contracts up to par? Yeah, I, I, I think the answer, I mean, it's so uh, typical, right, for an attorney to say this, but if, if you want to have confidence in what you're working with, you need to engage a, engage a legal profession, a uh, professional that knows and works with your industry. Um, that, I mean, that's, you know, there, there's no, you know, surefire way to have enforceable agreements whenever you're playing Google attorney. Now, that, that's not to say that there aren't resources out there, right? Like, there are great starting points uh, online, you know, the number of different uh, websites that you can go and, and look up sample agreements from a lot of law firms uh, include sample agreements on their websites as a starting point or as a skeleton. I would, you know, make sure that, you know, if you're doing this on your own, I, I'm not going to recommend any specific sites just because that's a little bit dicey, but definitely the, you know, large law firms, uh, the large international law firms have, are, are in the last few years starting to put out templates sort of as a marketing tool, but, you know, they're not legal services, but they're, they're a good place and they're often better, uh, you know, as, as a skeleton than what you, what you can find, uh, you know, when you're, when you're kind of poking around on your own and looking through medium articles, you know, a lot of times you're, you're going to get to sort of some suspect materials. And so they're, you know, th these big firms are pretty careful about what they put out and they're going to be vanilla and they're not going to be uh, tailored necessarily to, to what you're doing, but they, they are a good place uh, to start if, if you need just sort of a, a general, uh, you know, reference point. Uh, but, you know, I think, it, you know, a lot of this stuff really depends on, you know, how much uh, risk you're undertaking as well. So if you're, you know, dealing in contracts uh, that are hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, depending on your circumstance, right, uh, you might want to invest in, in those legal services to make sure that, you know, you're comfortable with what you're putting out there. Now, if you're doing ad hoc work, hourly rate and you're getting paid every week, maybe it's not such a big deal, right? Because the worst comes to worst, you're taking a hit on, you know, uh, only a week's worth of pay, right? But it, I mean, so it's, some of it's relative. And so you don't want to go spend $10,000 on, on a contract that, you know, it'll take you, you know, 15 years to realize the value of that. Um, but once it gets to, you know, sort of a, a, an amount where you're looking around like this better work, right? Then I think it's time to start engaging professionals because, this stuff is very complicated and it's also based on jurisdiction, you know, things, you know, you step over the border of California and now all of a sudden there's an entirely different uh, set of, of restrictions on what you can put in agreements and, you know, vice versa. I mean, likewise with a number of other states. Um, and so it's, it's really gets pretty specific and, and there are a number of industry specific uh, consideration and sort of contracting tips. So anytime, uh, you know, if you're doing this on your own and you've got your agreement, I think the best best advice I can give is to use plain language and make sure that, you know, you're not trying to guess on legal terms and not trying to use fancy terms that you don't know what they mean. Be very, very clear and specific and use plain words, plain English, because if you actually end up in court at some other time and, you, and you're representing yourself pro se, the judge is actually going to understand better if you're using, you know, plain and common language versus trying to use a bunch of legal language. I mean, I see it all the time. I get these where to for agreements where it's like, you know, they just basically went to a, a legal dictionary and start, you know, shoveling stuff in. And that's going to likely get you in trouble because all those things mean something, right? And they've got years and years and years and years and decades on hundreds of years of time of, of case law that builds up to how you use it. So stay away from that. Um, uh, but best advice is to, to find yourself a good attorney. And if, the, if this is your profession, if you got a job, and if the, this is feeding your family, uh, you should strike up a relationship with a professional anyways. You know, even if you don't engage their services, find somebody close to you, find somebody in your state, find, you know, find, find somebody that you like, talk to them, know them, you know, vet them out. And then, you know, if you ever need them, you, you've done that homework ahead of time. Marshall, did that answer your question? Yes. So, Jason, do you work with people outside of Florida? <laughs> there's, there's a fire alarm going it, on. If so we I'm did sorry. work with you, would mm -hmm. it be $10,000? That's what I want to know. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's funny you should mention that because yeah. Rodney, you know, just said, hey, can, can we just hire you? And, and, and it can be complicated, Jason. I mean, you're seeing a, a huge demand for a lot of these contracts. Like you and I were talking offline the other day. You're seeing mm -hmm. a lot of, of, yeah. of fresh businesses spawn and, and, 
there's a rush for this, right? And just like a lot of the, a lot of the uh, freelancers agencies are seeing a rush to the web, it's, it's a new, lot of new entrepreneurs, you know, what are you doing? And this is not necessarily related to, to the legal thing, but what are you doing as, a, as, a, as an individual, as, an, as, a, as a law firm? How are you positioning for that? Yeah, yeah and, and we're seeing a lot more of the, uh, you know, just, just sort of the companies that are going online. And then once you do, uh, especially brick and mortar companies, I, I really highlight a lot of the other things that you haven't necessarily paid a lot of attention to because you start going through checklists online for setting up what's, and you start seeing in terms of use and you start thinking to yourself, wow, like I've never done a lot of this stuff. So we are getting, uh, you know, a lot more business these days for people that are just trying to reach out and get their bearings and then realizing that, you know, they probably have meant to get to a lot of other things as well uh, to tighten up. And so um, we, we've, I think I mentioned it earlier, we're, we, we started implementing a, a contract management system. So it's a, you know, sort of a cloud-based software to help our clients with you know maintaining documents and giving them a, a you know central repository and, and able to you know send those things out and, and help them with the mechanics of you know the the whole proposal engagement and kind of customize this stuff so that it works for them uh, and sort of streamlines the process versus you know which is you know something we're all trying to get away from which is sending out word documents and having you know 18 back and forths with uh, somebody you know someone else's attorney and so to some extent, once you get to a certain threshold dollar wise, you know, a lot of times you're not going to have, you know, the luxury of getting somebody on the other side that's just going to agree. Um, but you can certainly position yourself, you know, to, to mitigate, you know, that process as much as possible. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, you're going to, you're going to save yourself some headache. Uh, if you are doing those big dollar contracts and you, and you get out in front of it and you have something that, you know, when you send it over, that it's within market norms and, and the, the attorney reviewing it on the other side is not going to come back and say, Hey, maybe you shouldn't do business with these people, you know, like, because now, you know, when they mark it up, it's just got nothing but red lines through it and you know, it might as well be uh, their version of the contract. So, um, so yeah, I, th I think it's just about leveraging technology to you know, help streamline this stuff. Copy. We ran a little over. I want to remind everybody, uh, uh, that that Jason is going to be uh, with us. Uh, Jason, when is it? It's going to be Wednesday the twelfth. Let me yep. double check that. Yeah, Wednesday the twelfth. Jason's agreed to a forum AMA. So if there are any questions, Jason's going to be around from two to three. I'm going to open it up at one p.m. though, so you can drop your questions. Uh, so we are going to have that. Uh, I'll I'll make an event after this, so everybody can keep up with that. And I appreciate you for that, Jason. Um, yeah. We we ran a little over. It's a little long here. Spirit Marshall, as our esteemed panelists here, are there any final questions you want to ask? And, and I'll give it a 30 second. I want to make no, sure. I'm good. This I'm is good. extreme. This is extremely helpful. <laughs> Great. Great. So uh, there are a few other questions. I didn't get to them because we, we did run a little long. Um, so, but I, I want to say thanks for everybody coming and Jason, thank you for taking time out of your day to, to really show us the ropes or for some of us, uh, we're not even on the rope anymore. <laughs> so, uh, I want to say thanks and Beerit and Marshall, oh, thank, thank, you, thank you both of y'all for coming and, and, and asking great questions and sharing your experience as well. So thanks everybody. Yeah, I really appreciate and it. Until bro. next time. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye y'all.